Well, good morning, folks. It's Sean, Victorian Piper, back here at Bliss Hill, Victorian Town. And today, despite thinking I was on the other engine, um, so I showed you the boiler last time and how that worked, uh, I'll pop a card up there for you to um, have a look at that if you've not seen it. Um, I've actually been changed onto one of the other engines today. Uh, so, slight change of plan because I was going to sort of show you the prep, getting that boiler lit and the prep for that. Um, but this time we're going to do pretty much the same thing, but in a slightly more complete manner, because today you can see that I'm going to be working this lovely old portable engine. Now, it's stone cold, it was run yesterday, um, but I've just checked, it's actually, most of the heat's gone out of this, so it's going to take a while to get steam up. So I'll pop the camera up somewhere and uh, I'll show you what we need to do to get this thing going and I'll explain what it is that we're doing at the time. So I'll switch the camera around, uh, get it set up, let's get this thing going. Okay, so similar to the other engine, um, bear in mind this is obviously a boiler and engine in one, so I'll explain why it was done like this a little bit later. But to get the fire lit and the boiler running, um, sequence is pretty much the same as the big one. Uh, so first thing to do is the dirty job, unfortunately, and that is clear out the ash pan. So let me find what I need. Usually got an old bin lid somewhere we use. Okay. So this is obviously going to be a slightly longer video. I'll edit it out where I can get rid of all the sort of unnecessary bits because you don't want to just be uh, watching not a lot for hours on end. Uh, I've not operated this engine for a while and straight away I can't find the thing we usually scrape the ash pan out with. So I'll use this old shovel which is actually broken but it'll do the job. cheating with a modern light but <coughs> it helps with this engine because it's a bit difficult to see into the firebox there it's pretty dark and hard to see and the same down in the ash pan it's just a handy little modern invention that helps Okay, so I'll just go and dump this, two seconds. There we go, so, as I said, this is the firebox. So as you can probably see from the general layout, this boiler is the same as how a locomotive would be. So it's horizontal, firebox this end, boiler, the actual water's in this section. And then we've got the smoke box at this other end and the chimney. I'll swing the camera around in a minute and we'll show you that. But first, I need to get this fire lit. So, <coughs> I have already checked, but checking that the fire grate is clear. There is actually, I'm going to get my arm filthy if I get in there. Um, there are a few bits of sort of old unburnt coal, but we need them. What I prefer to do is put a small layer of coal in, pop directly onto the fire grate. And we've got a mix here. We've got this is smokeless fuel, sort of man made product. And in these smaller engines, where we use a sort of, like I say, locomotive style boiler. And these work by the fire being here and then running through the water boiler are uh, a series of small pipes. 
the idea being that the fire in there obviously is where the heat's generated but with the chimney at the other end drawing the fire it pulls the hot gases through the pipes and it's the hot gases running through those pipes that run through the jacket that heats the water up and that's how we get the steam release. Complete opposite to the big boiler on the other engine which heats tubes full of water whereas this is like I say hot gases going through tubes through the water. So one of the other jobs we have to do in a minute is rod those tubes through because after a day of running and this is again the same for locomotives after a day of running those tubes get full of soot uh, and the occasional bit of debris and that's generally that is what um, cokes them up and then obviously as the tubes get full of soot and rubbish uh, your, your flow of gas through there is a lot less and they're slightly insulated by the soot so you're not getting the heat transfer to the water so we'll rub those through in a minute and that will clear those tubes out Morning. Good morning. Alright, right. yeah, good. Okay, so we've got a bit of a layer of coal there. We don't want too much because if you cover up the grate, you're not getting that oxygen flow flow from underneath through the ash pan. Uh, and it's a lot harder to get the fire going then. So next we'll get some wood. One of our jobs during the day while the engine's running and we've got a quiet lull is to make sure we've got a lot of wood ready to get the engine going. This one does tend to prefer to run on wood actually. Um, because the tubes are so small through the boiler, it gets coked up quite easily with what we're just saying about rodding it. So although you can rod it during the day, it's not a problem to open up the smoke box while the engine's running and, and run the rods through. Um, it does tend to prefer wood. Now I can actually feel this is ever so slightly damp, which isn't great. So this might be a bit of a pain to get going. Um, again, we keep a lot of wood in the winding engine in the big boiler room, but because it's such a big boiler and it stays warm in there overnight, it keeps the wood dry. Hi Jack, you alright? Yeah, well mate, yeah. Yeah, good. Good. Um, cool. Yeah, I'll get on then for you. Yeah, no worries for you. Yeah, yeah be good. Time, I do a couple like before I go for lunch when the fire's winding down or something. And uh, yeah, I'll get them. I'll get them sorted all right. Brilliant, yeah. Thank no you, worries. Jack. See you later. Okay, so there'll be an edit there, obviously, because I've just had a lengthy conversation with Jack, our blacksmith. He's off down to the forge. Um, that's something we'll show you on another day. Um, Jack also makes occasional videos, so he's more than up for it. So we'll do something. I'll come in one of the days when I'm not obviously operating the engines and we'll go down and show you the forge. Um, show you the forge operating and Jack at work and he does make some pretty incredible stuff to be honest. Right then, another slight modern invention that's gonna save us a bit of time. If I can find them in my bag, we are going to cheat a little and use fire lighters. Yeah. <coughs> uh, yeah, I guess that's the only thing at this time of the morning. It's easy to film, but you've got no the people coming in, so if this video is a bit uh, choppy, I do apologise. So yep, yeah, we're going to cheat slightly, and we're going to use modern fire lighters. Because these make the job an awful lot easier. Get that fire going quicker. I've already lost a bit of time talking to Jack, so I need to get this thing lit. Also handy when you smoke a pipe, you've always got a lighter of it. Okay, a little bit more wood. Not sure if that's going to show up on the camera because of the angle. Have a quick look. Oh yes, you can see the fire's going there. Right, so I'll throw a bit more wood on there and we'll shift the camera around. 
and rod out the tubes. Right, now I'm perched rather precariously on the driving wheel of the crusher, which we'll see later. So someone's, someone's jammed that the wrong, I'll have to sort that out a bit. Okay, so this is the smoke box end. As you can see, there is a little bit of smoke coming through already from the fire. So you can see it's, well, you might not be able to see, it's really quite sooty. So what you need to do is we've got a set of rods. None of them are particularly good. And what we need to do is all these individual tubes is run the rod through just to clear them out and push this up back into the smoke box end. So there's two large tubes got a brush that does a decent job on that one and again I think with the smoke you probably can't see it on camera but there's an awful lot coming out so I would suggest they definitely didn't rob this through during the day yesterday there we go that's the two bigger ones and for the smaller ones we haven't got a brush, we've only got a steel rod and this is usually used for dealing the blockage. That's all I've got at the minute. And as you can see this is a rather laborious job because I've got a lot of these tubes to run through. So I think what we'll do is rather than bore you with this is I'll stop the camera, rod the rest of this through, clear out this soot at the bottom and then we'll show you something more interesting and we'll show the actual engine and get a pipe going. Okay then folks, fire's lit, might be able to hear that crackling and popping. I've had a bit of trouble with it because that uh, with that damp wood I thought it might be a problem so we'll show you around the engine now so obviously as you've seen if I can get that there we go so firebox door ash pan at the bottom wide open to get the oxygen into the fire now similar to the big boiler this is my water gauge I think you can just make it out the water's almost right up at the top there's only about an inch there showing on the gauge so we've got plenty of water this is the pressure gauge if I can get it to focus okay now this engine usually runs between that 75 and 100 pounds of pressure will run on a lot less depends how it's feeling on the day it's quite temperamental this engine obviously it's very old um, so it's actually a replica if we tell you a bit about it first actually it's actually a sort of a replica of an engine of its era so early 1800s right up through till the 1900s now although it's on a pedestal at the bottom there it's sort of bolted to the floor um, we can move it and it's designed to be on uh, iron wheels hence the name portable now these were basically the generator of the day so the engine mounted on top there obviously does the work the wheel that's nearest to us on our side of the engine that's the drive wheel and then the wheel on the opposite side is the flywheel chimney goes off up through the ceiling there i'd show you the top of the chimney but the sun's coming right over the top and all you'd get is a blinded camera so the idea is this would be horse drawn you could take it anywhere you needed to do work now over here is the crusher i mentioned earlier as you can see belt driven off the engine small contained units so the idea is the engine could be taken anywhere you wanted to do work and you had machinery so this thing hopefully i can show you it running later literally feed rocks into it that back plate there moves in an oscillating motion pulls the rocks down between the teeth crushes them up turns them into hardcore now we've got lots of old sort of building debris 
uh, that we get hold of. We crush it up, turn it into the hardcore, and then our ground crew, ground crew, they use that to repair pathways, car parks, whatever they need it for. So the engine, like I say, would be taken anywhere to do anything because pretty much every bit of machinery back then was belt driven. So you could obviously hook this up to anything you wanted. Now I have seen them on TV a few times. Uh, most recently the Hatfield and McCoy's mini series. I seem to remember rightly, there was one of these at the logging concern and they used it to run obviously a, a, I guess a portable sawmill at the time. So you do see them occasionally in movies, obviously um, because of their portable nature, they were ideal uh, for sort of uh, uh, America where you were heading out west because uh, a couple of horses could drag this thing and then you could do whatever you needed to do. So back to showing you what it was about. So obviously we've seen the water gauge, pressure gauge, their drains for the boiler. The taps down here are the blow down for the gauge so we can test the gauge. Basically we blow the water out under pressure, clears the gauge, we shut them off, the gauge comes back up. That way you can check your water levels accurate. So coming round to the side, obviously as I said, firebox, tubes, which you saw when I cleared them out, run through the boiler full of water to the smoke box and then up the chimney. Then the drawer on the chimney is what pulls the gases through. But we can also speed up the process when we've got a bit of steam. So this is the master valve. So at the minute that's closed. So once we do get steam, none of it actually gets through to the engine. And what we have here is a steam blower. Now when we get steam pressure, and you'll notice this is before the main master tap, we can turn this on. Obviously there's no steam now, so nothing's happening. That runs through the copper pipe that you can just follow here, and you'll see it goes into the chimney. What happens is that blasts steam up the chimney, and that steam rushing up the chimney draws on the smoke box, pulls the hot gases through. So once we've got a little bit of steam, the first thing we do is we don't run the engine, we run the blower. That pulls the fire even faster and hotter, feed more fuel, and we can get the thing um, up to temperature a lot quicker with the steam blower running. This obviously here then, this is the main tap to control the steam once we've opened the master. This controls the steam actually to the engine itself. So similar to the big engine we've got, steam engine design didn't really change any. They all work on the same principle. So the steam goes in here in the middle. There's a slide valve in there that lets steam in one side of the piston, pushes it. There's a big hole in the middle for the exhaust to go out. And that's where we go through this larger pipe. You can see here, that's the exhaust again, out to the chimney, which also helps um, the draw. Um, and then as this moves backwards and forwards, in fact, we can show you. So this smaller one that's moving in the foreground now, that moves the plate with the holes in it across the steam chest, which is the big box. So steam in one side, pushes it that way. The plate moves round, because obviously that's the main drive on there. So steam is then applied either side. So it pushes, 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 pushes. So unlike a car engine, you're applying power on both sides of the piston. So as you could just see over there, obviously this is the main. So that's actually the piston arm going in and out there. Which then drives this drive wheel. The flywheel on the back there obviously helps the momentum and also keeps the engine running a little smoother. Without that, it would be quite bang, bang. Um, it helps smooth it out. You'll also see attached to that is the concentric. And there's two concentrics. So one, which we've seen, drives the, uh, the plate to let, allow the steam entry to either side of the cylinder. The one over the back there, and this is quite good for this engine, it's, it's, a, it's a blessing and a curse. We'll go around the back. And that arm drives this. 
which is the water pump. Now, it's a good thing and a bad thing in that in, it's, it's effectively a free powered pump. Uh, it doesn't need any external power. It runs off the engine running. Now there's the downside. You can only get water into the boiler to keep that water level up if the engine's running. So if you've run out of water or your water level's very low, but at the same time you've got virtually zero steam pressure, you have a problem because you need the engine running to pump water back in to the boiler. Now the way this works is obviously when the engine's running, this thing, excuse my, I'm leaning over myself. So this thing runs all the time. Now we don't want to keep pumping water in because that brings the steam pressure down and obviously it gets the, the boiler could end up absolutely chock full. And then if the boiler's full, there's no room for steam. So what it does, in its default form, you'll see these hoses running off into this barrel full of water. So in its default form, it basically just pumps internally. It just goes round in a loop, which is why there's two hoses. One's sucking up, one's blowing back down. So when we don't need water, and the pump's obviously running with the engine, we're just basically pumping water around in a circuit. When we do want water, and this is sort of backwards there, you consider it, we close the tap, that closes the circuit, and that then pumps water through this copper pipe into the boiler. So it's quite cool that, having the steam pump on the side. The only problem is, because of the way we're set up, obviously there's the main street where the visitors are. They don't see this, which is a bit of a shame. And obviously they don't see this side of the engine, so there's the maker's plate. And this is what we're saying about this being a replica. So this engine, as you can see, was an economizer. And this has gone on long enough. I'm sure you probably, well, not maybe not bored, but I won't go into what this engine did originally. But if you have a little Google for a green and sun economizer, that'll tell you what it did. It had a very specific purpose, this engine. But obviously now for us, this has been bolted onto our boiler. Now this boiler, as I was saying earlier, is very much like a locomotive boiler. That's how these engines, portable engines, were designed. But in this case, it is quite literally a locomotive boiler. This was built in 1930, and it was for a narrow gauge railway, but never used. So it's something we acquired uh, and actually built this in-house. So this whole portable engine setup, um, we built here. Obviously not me, I've not been here that long, but yeah, built internally. So let's have a look at how our fire's doing. It's popping and cracking. But it's, mm, it actually looks quite good on camera, but looking at it in reality, it's not great. So I better get some more fuel on that. So anyway, that's a tour of our engine. Oh, I did forget one thing. And this is one thing that, you know, people like to see. This here is the governor. And you can see when I press down, those iron balls play out. And when the engine's running, this spins. And if the engine starts to run too quickly, as these balls spin out with the centrifugal force, it pushes down and down and down and down, and eventually it will trigger, and that actually cuts the steam feed to the engine. So this engine, unlike the big winding engine, does have a safety mechanism on it in, in that governor. You can adjust it so that it will shut off earlier or later, depending on the working speed you want of the engine. Um, but we, we never work this particularly quickly because you don't want that crusher spinning around at massive RPM because it's just, I guess it's dangerous enough throwing rocks in there, but with it absolutely whizzing around, it wouldn't be good. So that's about it for the, uh, the tour, showing you around this engine. Like I say, it's been a longer video, this one, I'm aware of that, but then there's a lot to show you and a lot to go through. So I'm going to get uh, get on. I'm going to get my pipe lit. Okay then folks, that's it. We're all set. Just about to open to the public, so I'll, uh, I'll have to shut off now anyway. Smoking my odds and bods again in that uh, lovely mission from Tree. Might be able to hear it, but the fire's crackling away nicely now. There's also a bit of, bit of heat in it, so... Just a waiting game now until we get the steam up. But uh, hopefully I'll show you the engine running later. My wife and daughter are popping in 
uh, my daughter has, and I'm going to take her up on it, been rather enthusiastic about coming and uh, helping me out here with the engines. So we need to get the younger generations involved with this kind of thing. So I'm all up for that. But hopefully I'll get Abby to um, film the engine running and you can actually see what it does. But other than that, I'll leave it there. There might be a bit after this, as I said, of the engine running. But from me, thank you for watching. I know it's been a longer one and I'll try and edit as best I can. But anyway, you all have a good day. Keep safe and I'll see you soon. Thank you. 